put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Welcome to the story of ancient Egypt and Moses and all the other interesting pharaohs. Before telling you about Moses, the greatest genius of antiquity, just a little lesson from the life of another famous pharaoh. Senefru started out and built the first pyramid, the black one. It was a total disaster. What should he do? Give up or try again? Well, he tried again. This time he had a little more success, but as you can see, the Ben Pyramid was another failure. By this time, Pharaoh Senefru spent a fortune on his two failures. What should he do? Give up or try again? What should you and I do about the past and the present failures? Give up or try again? I'm so glad that he tried again. Here you're looking at the Red Pyramid of Senefru. Perseverance is the master of defeat. If you are despairing, think of Senefru. Get yourselves a new dream and start working on it. Remember, perseverance is the master of defeat. The success story does not end here. His son was so inspired by his father's perseverance. And today you visit Giza and you stand in awe at the grandeur of the Pyramid of Khufu, the biggest ever built. Someone is watching you. Someone wants to inspire you with their perseverance. Ask God to help you keep on trying and trying and never quit. Did you know that the pyramids were used as burial places for the Pharaoh? But this is a very expensive way to bury people. And when it became too costly, they started to bury people in the Valley of the Kings down at Luxor. I've done a very interesting study of the Pharaohs who were buried here especially those who were connected to the Bible story. In this presentation, I want to spend a few minutes on the life of Tutmosis I. Archaeologists discovered his tomb recently. He was the first pharaoh to be buried in the Valley of the Kings. Every time I visit this tremendous temple of Karnak, I think about the story of Moses. Tutmosis I became king in 533 B.C., that's when Aaron was born. Three years later, Moses was born in 530, 1530. If you can read more about the mighty deeds of the Pharaoh of this obelisk, do so. His daughter Hatshepsut also erected an obelisk in the same temple where she tells her story. It is quite an experience to visit her mortuary temple at Tir el Bari, one of the most impressive structures in Egypt. I got so excited when I came across this interesting relief. This is the wife, expecting wife of Tutmosis I. She is three months pregnant with her daughter Hatshepsut. She was the princess who discovered the little Hebrew baby boy Moses in the Nile and saved his life. This is such an exciting story that I'm going to continue with it. We're going to identify all the pharaohs who featured in the life of Moses I'm going to take you also to the tomb of Pharaoh, the one who drowned in the Red Sea. He and Moses spent quite a few years together in the Egyptian royal palace. You will also be introduced to Amenhotep II, whose eldest boy died in the 10th plague. Then we have the exciting story of Tutmosis IV. You will hear his account of how the Sphinx spoke to him and what he told the young prince. My dear friend, don't miss the balance of this exciting story on the life of Moses, the greatest genius who ever lived. He is a type of Christ. And may Christ fill you with all his beauty as you study him in typology. God bless. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Today we're going to talk about the crime of all ages and you're probably wondering what that could be. Well, our first slide over here shows the stream of time through history as we find it in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Do you remember the text in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4 
where it talks about the man of sin. Let not anyone deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come unless there first comes a falling away, and the man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition. Now we dealt with that in our last lecture. And we see that he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, setting himself forth that he is God. Now we defined this power as the papacy that claims that it has the power to play God, to change God's law, to do whatever it wants to do, even change the precepts of Christ. Is it important whether we keep God's law or whether we don't keep God's law? Is God's law immutable or is it changeable? Today we have a theology in the world that we are not under law but are under grace. Now that is a contradiction in terms, if there ever was a contradiction in terms. There is no need for grace if there is no law. Without a law, there can be no transgression. So if you take the law away, there can be no transgression and then there's no need for grace. So grace determines that there must be a law. So whoever proclaims grace must at the same time proclaim law. So how do we deal with this confusion? For sin shall not have dominion over you, it says in Romans 6, 14 and 15. For you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. You see, the law is not a means to salvation. But the law tells us what sin is. And if we understand the law, we can stay away from sin. We are under grace because we are sinners, transgressors of the law, and are in need of grace. So grace is our lifeline. Does that mean we don't have to keep the law? God forbid. Of course we have to keep the law. Do we then make void the law through faith, asks Paul? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. In other words, if you want to cling to grace, you better know why you need grace. Because you are a sinner and I am a sinner and we are all in need of grace because we are all lawbreakers. And God wants to bring us back into harmony with the law. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Romans 7, 12. The Bible is very clear that you cannot do without God's, God's law because God's law defines the territory in which we must move and hedges us in and protects us. In fact, it is so important to God that he wrote it with his own finger. In fact, God wrote only three times with his own finger. Once when he wrote the law, once when he wrote on the wall in the time of Daniel, when the time of Babylon was over, and once when he wrote in the sand. Very interesting. And the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, it says in Deuteronomy 9.10. Now, there are those who claim that the law is no more. We are living in the New Testament times. We are living under a new dispensation. We are not under law. We are under grace. Well, if you read the New Testament, you will find the law of God in the New Testament. So we find the first law, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. We find it in Matthew. We find it in Revelation. The second commandment, little children, keep yourself from idols. We read that in 1 John 5, 21. We also find it in Acts. And the third law of God, that the name and his doctrine should not be blasphemed. In other words, blasphemy. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. The fourth commandment regarding the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And the Commandments dealing with human relations, we find them all in the New Testament. Here they are. Honor thy father and thy mother in Matthews and Ephesians. Thou shalt not kill in Romans. Thou shalt not commit adultery in Matthew. Thou shalt not steal in Romans and Ephesians. Thou shalt not bear false witness in Romans 13.9. And then the 10th commandment. 
Thou shalt not covet. We find that in Romans 7.7. 7. So all the commandments are in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament. And just as binding in New Testament times as they were in Old Testament times. Now, why do we have this confusion? You see, the world is keeping some of the commandments and assigning some of the commandments to the trash heap. And to explain this, many, many go the further step of getting rid of the entire law to explain their actions. Now, where does all this come from? And where do we find the heart of the problem? Do you remember the little horn power that we spoke about that would change times and laws? Daniel 7.25. And we want to ask ourselves the question, why is this so important? And what law did this power change? The fourth commandment is the commandment which reminds us of our heritage. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, thy cattle, thy stranger, that is within thy gate. So, very plain injunction. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in the meas, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 28 to 11. So the Sabbath is a memorial to creation. If I know where I come from, then I know whom I belong to and I also know where I am going. So the Sabbath day was instituted by God as a memorial to His creative act. Now, if we continue and discuss the importance of the Sabbath in the Bible, we will learn some interesting things. Exodus 31, 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So where do I get my relationship from that is to change this heart of stone into a heart of flesh? I get it from God. Which God? Of the plethora of gods out there in the world. The Creator God who instituted the Sabbath as a sign for all generations. Exodus 31, 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for a perpetual covenant. Well, wasn't it then only for the children of Israel? Or was it for all? Let's look at this word sign, the Hebrew oath. Between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. There's another interesting word in Hebrew, nafash. Two words, a sign and he was refreshed. Now we've discussed some of these issues in a previous lecture. Let's just look at the sign again. If we look up in the concordance, then it tells us that it means a sign, a token, an ensign, a miracle, a mark, a signal, a distinguishing mark, a banner. So it's a standard here is the mark of God, and it's the Sabbath which is being referred to over here. So, if we want to understand the mark of God and why it's important, we have to look at this particular issue, this seal of God, His sign, His mark. Now, a seal authenticates a document. It makes it legal. So the President of the United States, when something is enacted as a law, he places his seal under it and he signs it and then it becomes law. The ancient kings, they had a seal and on it was the name of the king, his title, king, and then his territory, whatever it was. Here we have uh, a dominion of Great Britain and the dominions and the title, king, and the name, George VI, the typical sovereign seal. Now, God's seal is in the heart of his law. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Six days you shall labor and do all thy work. The seventh day, not the first, not the third, not the fourth, 
The seventh day is the one set aside, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Why? For in six days the Lord, there's the name, Lord, Yahweh, made, creator, his title, heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, his jurisdiction. Without a seal, a document has no legal value. So here we have a document, the Ten Commandments, which are sealed with the title, creator, the name, the Lord, Yahweh, and the jurisdiction, heaven and earth. This is a universal law, and we find it only in the fourth commandment. In fact, we can say that without the fourth commandment, the ten commandments in their entirety are invalid. Because who gave them? It could be Joe Blow who gave them. But very specifically, they get their authority from the fourth commandment. So by keeping the fourth commandment, I acknowledge the authority of the lawgiver. So it must contain the seal, his name, his title, and his territory, and we find it only in the Sabbath commandment. I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign, a distinguishing mark. So if I keep the Sabbath, I acknowledge the Creator God as the authority in my life. In Isaiah, we read something interesting. If thou turn thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. What a marvelous injunction on how we should keep the Sabbath. Not legally, as a legalistic duty, I am a Sabbath keeper. We are to keep it as a delight. We must call it a delight, holy, honorable. We come into relationship with God because we want to have a relationship with our Creator. And the heritage of Jacob, that's eternal life. So, don't think that I am saying you are saved only because you keep the Sabbath. You are saved because you have come into covenant relationship with the Creator God who can recreate you and save you from your transgressions. Was it only for the Jews? No. Isaiah 56, 6 and 7, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord to be His servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath you see, the Sabbath is the sign of the acknowledgement of the authority of God. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So the Sabbath arose in Eden. It was not for the Jews only, and it was for the strangers as well. What was the purpose of the Sabbath? It was a day of rest. Now, rest not reclining and sleeping. Rest finding rest for your troubled soul in God. It was a day of blessing. It was a day of peace. It was a sign, a distinguishing mark, a memorial to creation, a symbol of sanctification, a hallowed day, and a perpetual covenant. Those are all the symbologies embodied in the Sabbath day. But mankind has a way of forgetting. And that's why Isaiah has this injunction where he says, Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments, always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever, Deuteronomy 5, 29. The Lord does not make restrictions because He is a hard taskmaster. He makes restrictions because He cares about us and our welfare and our relationships with Him and with one another. So the question we have today is if the Sabbath is so important, it is the seal of God, the mark of God, the sign of God, 
a perpetual covenant, then why does the Christian world keep Sunday, which is the first day of the week? Sunday so-called because this day was anciently dedicated to the sun or its worship, says Webster's International Dictionary, the 19th edition. Modern dictionaries are somewhat more, more careful in their, well, in the way they put it. Let's say it that way. Sunday, dear solace of the Roman calendar, day of the sun being dedicated to the sun, the first day of the week. There is the Schaffhauser Encyclopedia regarding Sunday. Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. There's another encyclopedia. So very clearly, the first day of the week was very different in terms of its worship environment than was the Sabbath. But Christianity today largely keeps the Sunday. Here's a dictionary definition. Seventh day, Saturday, the seventh day of the week. So Saturday is the seventh day. Now, why do we keep Sunday? Do you remember that the papacy claims that it has the power to change God's law? The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Decretal de translat episcop cap. Can we imagine such an assumption of power over and beyond what anybody could imagine? That there would be a power who would so usurp its authority as to attack the very precepts of God? Now, this is now no longer a war of a day. This becomes a war of authority. Here is another power claiming authority. A power that claims authority over and above God's word. The Roman Decretalia declare he, the Pope, can pronounce sentences and judgments in contradiction to the right of nations, to the law of God and man. He can free himself from the commands of the apostles, he being their superior, and from the rules of the Old Testament. This is ultimate arrogance. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, we can now better understand what Paul is writing about. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin, the one who boastfully transgresses, even changes God's law, will be revealed. The son of perdition who assumes to give Jesus a kiss, but denies him in his actions, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, these words get meaning. The Pope's will stands for reason. He can dispense above the law and of wrong make right by correcting and changing laws. Pope Nicholas, correcting and changing laws, even God's law? Amazing. Do they know that they have actually changed the day? Yes, they do. And they are proud of it. What does that tell us? They are boasting with their own authority over and above the authority of God. Which is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And this comes from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 1957. They are just as bold today as they were in those days. The Catholic record, which was an official mouthpiece of the Roman Catholic Church, says, Sunday is our mark of authority. So it's not a question of the day any longer. It's now a question of whose authority do I subscribe to? Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So here they say it is their mark. And the Bible calls them a horn or a beast, a political entity, and it claims to have a mark. 
She took the pagan Sunday and made it the Christian Sunday, and thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to Balder became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. Catholic World, March 1894. They are well aware of what they have done. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. Faith of our fathers, Cardinal Gibbons. So here the Roman Catholic Church clearly defines its mark of authority. In the Catholic Press, Sunday, August 25, 1900, the Church wrote, Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, there is not a single passage which warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. They know exactly what they are doing. In fact, some of their language is so strong that it boggles the mind. Father Enright in the American Sentinel, June 1893, wrote, The Bible says, Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, No. By my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. They are boasting with their power. They are not hiding it or scared of it. Pope Pius, commanded by the Council of Trent in 1566, said, It pleased the Church of God that the religious celebration of the Sabbath day should be transferred to the Lord's Day, Sunday, Catechism Romanus, 1867. So today, the Lord's Day is Sunday, but nowhere in the Bible is the first day of the week defined as the Lord's Day. On the contrary, only the seventh day is called the Lord's Day in Isaiah chapter 58. So the text which reads in Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Revelation 1.10, what day was that? If thou turn thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath the delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, Isaiah 58, 13, then we have to understand that there is no injunction for us to say that the Lord's Day is Sunday. In fact, we only have one biblical reference, and that is the Sabbath, the seventh day. So John was in vision on a Sabbath day on the day which he referred to as honorable. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. It means he was in the spirit on the Sabbath day. The Lord gave him a vision on that particular day. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Mark 2.28 He is the Lord of the Old Testament Sabbath and he is the Lord of the New Testament Sabbath. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. This is Rome speaking. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. James Cardinal Gibbons, Faith of Our Fathers. They are very clear. They know exactly what they are doing. The Christian Sabbath is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church's spouse of the Holy Ghost without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. So they are boasting, they are casting it before men and saying, look who you are obeying, you are obeying us. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. Albert Smith, Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Baltimore replying for the cardinal in a letter. They are well aware of what they are saying. Protestantism in discarding the authority of the Roman Catholic Church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. This is probably the most presumptuous statement they have ever made. Not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. Unbelievable that a church and its leaders could make such statements. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday, compromise is impossible. So why do Protestants keep Sunday? We will deal with this issue 
when we continue. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. So why does the Protestant world keep Sunday? The Roman Church has officially written that to argue from Scripture that Sunday is the correct day of worship is dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. Now the Protestant world in general does know that Saturday is the Sabbath day. Here we have some Protestant testimony. The Episcopal Church writes, Is there any command in the New Testament to change the day of weekly rest from Saturday to Sunday? None. Manual of Christian Doctrine, page 17. We have made a change from the seventh day to the first from Saturday to Sunday on the authority of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Christ. So they know exactly why they keep Sunday. The Lutheran Testimony. The observance of the Lord's Day, Sunday, is founded not on any command of God, but on the authority of the Church, the Augsburg Confession, that is their ultimate document, Catholic Sabbath, Manual Part 2. Presbyterian testimony, the change of the day to be observed from the last day of the week to the first, there is no record, no express command authorizing this change. This comes from the Christian Sabbath, page 60. The Presbyterians, the change of the day to be observed from the last day of the week or to the first, there is no record, no express command authorizing this change. The Methodists, take the matter of Sunday. There is no passage telling Christians to keep that day or to transfer the Jewish Sabbath to that day. Of course, there is no such thing as a Jewish, Jewish Sabbath. It is the Sabbath from Genesis through to Revelation. The Congregationalists, it is quite clear that however rigidly or devoutly we spend Sunday, we are not keeping the Sabbath. There is not a single sentence in the New Testament to suggest that we incur any penalty by violating the supposed sanctity of Sunday. An article on the Ten Commandments. As far as the Anglicans are concerned, they write, many people think that Sunday is the Sabbath, but neither in the New Testament nor in the early church is there anything to suggest that we have any right to transfer the observance of the seventh day of the week to the first. The Sabbath was and is Saturday and not Sunday. The Reverend Lionel Beer, Church and People, written in 1947. The Baptists. There was and is a command to keep holy the Sabbath day, but the Sabbath day was not Sunday. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh day to the first. Where does this come from? It comes from Dr. Edwards T. Hiscox, who is the author of the Baptist manual. They are aware of it. Almost all the churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries, the Lord's Supper, on the Sabbath of every week. Yet the Christians of Alexandria and Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this ecclesiastical history. So the early church kept Sabbath. In fact, the Sabbath was kept 
until very recently in most parts of the world, even remnants remain of that in Africa, right down to Ethiopia. But from this ancient tradition, there came a change. And Sunday supplanted Saturday. Fascinating. Therefore, Sunday is founded not on scripture but on tradition and is distinctly a Catholic institution. The Catholic record, 1893. The New Testament makes no explicit mention that the apostles changed the day of worship and we know it from tradition, the new revised Baltimore Catechism. So the world is basing its authority on some tradition. What does God have to say about that? In Matthew 15 we read, But he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And you voided the commandments of God by your tradition? But in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So you cannot change God's law and think that God will just bat an eye and close an eye. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions, Mark 7, 7-9. Fortunately, there are texts in the Bible that say that if you unknowingly do these things by conviction, then God accepts what you are doing and he winks at, the Bible says, your former ignorance regarding this issue. But if you're knowingly doing it, like the Roman Catholic Church has done it, well, then you have to give an account. A very definite account. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scripture because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday not by command of Christ but by its own authority. Canon and Tradition, page 263. Here, there is no excuse whatsoever. In the year 2003, Rome reissued its challenge on its Immaculate Heart webpage, and it said, Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday, and that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings only on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. That's straight talk. And yet there are many, many Protestants who will still try to argue from the Bible that Sunday is the right day of worship. And they quote mainly eight texts in the Bible. Let's briefly look at them. The first day of the week in the New Testament. And they claim, you see, the early church kept Sunday. No, the early church never kept Sunday. And the Catholic Church, as well as most of the Reformed theologians, knew exactly where they were standing in regard to this issue. The first text of the eight, we find it in Matthew 28, 1, and in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the others, Mary, to see the sepulcher. Uh, the NEB, the New English Bible, says the Sabbath had passed and it was about daybreak on Sunday when Mary. So there is no injunction here to keep the day special, so the first text really does not give us a basis to change the day of worship. And that day was the preparation, says the Bible. Friday, the preparation day, used only for the preparation day for the weekly Sabbath. And the Sabbath drew on, and the women also came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid, and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So they kept this, the Sabbath, and the first day was just mentioned as the day on which Christ rose from the dead. The second text, we find that in Mark 16, 1 and 2. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, the mother, Mary the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Again, just a historic account, no change whatsoever there. The third text, Mark 16, 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. It's again a statement of fact. There is no injunction to change the day. 
The fourth text, we find it in Luke 24, 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher bringing spices. So all the Gospels refer to this as a historic event. There is no injunction to change the day in these first texts. Let's look at the next four. The fifth text, John 20, verse 1. The first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and sees the stone taken away. Again, a historic account of the events surrounding the resurrection. The sixth text, John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and says unto them, Peace be unto you. So now some will argue, well, the disciples had come together to worship. And it was the first day of the week. There's the first injunction to worship on the first day of the week. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says it was the first of the day of the week and they knew the Sabbath was over and therefore persecution could commence because the church leaders would not have done anything on the Sabbath day. So they came together not to worship but for fear of the Jews. So there's no injunction here whatsoever to change the day. Let's look at the seventh text, Acts 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, obviously, some will claim here, well, they came together to hold Holy Communion. They came together to break bread. And uh, it was the first day of the week. Please note, we'll be dealing with that issue in, in a moment, the time when they actually came together. So Paul was preaching to them, and he was ready to depart in the morrow, so he preached until midnight. So the NEB translation says they came together Saturday night. Remember the Sabbath went from Sunday to sundown, sun up to sundown, and so here they were coming together after the Sabbath day to deal with many issues and Paul spoke to them until midnight. Poor old Eutychus couldn't handle it anymore, fell out the window because he fell asleep and uh, fortunately for him, for him, the Lord raised him. So it was Saturday night when they came together. There were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. So it wasn't the morning service, it was after the Sabbath and he therefore was, came up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. Now if the Sunday was such a holy day and had replaced the Sabbath, why would he depart the next day to walk many, many miles on his journey? Now we had a church meeting after the Sabbath. The Sabbath was holy, so this meeting for the church and breaking bread took place after the Sabbath. So was it a worship service in the sense as people would have it be? And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of hearts, Acts 2, 46. So because they broke bread on the first day, does that make it a special day? The Bible says they broke bread on every day. So again, there is no injunction, rather contrary to that, they kept the Sabbath so holy that they had this extra meeting in the evening before Paul departed the next day. So now let's look at the final text. We find it in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, in fact the Weirmoth translation says at his home, as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. So here was a collection, a church service, and they took up the collection, so some claim. No, no. Paul says, do this on the first day of the week at home. Why? They were probably weekly earners, and so they earned their pay on a Friday. They received their pay. The Sabbath was coming closer. Do not interfere with the Sabbath by doing these secular things on the Sabbath day, but on the first day of the week, when that arrives, then lay aside your money, and then when I come to the churches, I will come collect it. So there's nothing about a church service here. In fact, the Weirmoth translation 
implies that it means at home and nothing to do with a church service. So the eight texts, not one of them, proves that Sunday has taken the place of Saturday. Did Jesus change the law on the Sabbath? And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read, Luke 4, 16. So Jesus kept the Sabbath day as his custom was. Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to live out, to be a living example. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17 to 18. As far as I'm concerned, the earth is still here. The heavens, as we know them, are still there. And therefore, not one jot or one tittle has passed from the law. For even here unto where ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Jesus kept the Sabbath, so I should keep the Sabbath. In fact, all the patriarchs, all the apostles, right down through the ages, everybody kept the Sabbath. Everybody preached that they were waiting for a heavenly city. He that says he abideth him in ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. If we keep the Sabbath day, we are in good company. I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus didn't change. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing which has gone out of my mouth. Psalms 89 verse 4, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13 8. I had to make this decision in my own life. And I realized that if I fall under the authority of God, I have to show the world that I believe that by keeping the Sabbath. Isn't it amazing that from Friday night until the Sabbath hours are over, the world goes crazy? The biggest business, the biggest sport, the biggest activities, the most drinking, all of these issues. We have to be very circumspect. Because if we love him, we will keep his commandments. John 14, 15. If we, you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The law is not taken away. John 15, 10. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, verse 4. The biblical injunctions are very, very clear. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, 3. We cannot do away with the whole law because we want to cling to Sunday and give it some biblical injunction. There is no such command in the Bible. There is no such command from God anywhere that is recorded. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. 1 Peter 2.21 Did the cross change the Sabbath day? Because some people say, we are now celebrating the resurrection. And that is why the Sabbath has been done away with. We're keeping the resurrection day. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ when we are baptized. We are baptized into his death and we are raised with him into a newness of life. There is no injunction that the one day has taken the place of the other. So did the cross change the Sabbath? And that day was the preparation. We're talking about the Friday and the Sabbath drew on. Luke 23, 54. The women also which came with him from Galilee follow after and beheld the sepulcher and how the body was laid. Verse 55. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rest at the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So there's no change here. They're still keeping the seventh day in Luke 23, 56. And then on the first day of the week, they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. So no injunction to change the day. So if we look at the three days, the sixth day, that was the preparation. And that word is used only for the Friday preceding the seventh-day Sabbath. And the Sabbath drew on. Then there's the Sabbath day. He rested, and uh, they rested. And on the eighth day, 
On the first day of the week, they went unto the sepulcher and found it empty. Isn't it interesting that creation took seven days? Six days of labor for God, creating the world, and on the seventh day, he rested. The recreation of the world, we find the last week of Jesus expounded in the book of Mark, and we go through it day by day, and on the preparation day, the sixth day, we go into the hours, and then Jesus died, and he rested the Sabbath day. And on the first day, he rose. There is no injunction, however, that this changed the day of rest. So the cross, the resurrection, all of them are in harmony with the creation week and not with some new dispensation. Some will argue, can we really be sure which day is the Sabbath day? After all, we've had so many eons of time. Who even knows which day is the Sabbath day? I ask you a question. Which day do the Jews keep up to this day? They keep the Saturday, the seventh day of the week. But let's be somewhat more circumspect. Let's go and ask the scientific fraternity whether the days have in any way changed or the times changed in any way. Well, here we have the Washington, D.C., um, document which speaks about this issue. As to the question, I can only state, and this question refers to the weekly cycle as we have known it, has there been any change? As to the question, I can only state that in connection with the proposed simplification of the calendar, we have had occasion to investigate the results of the work of specialists in chronology, and we have never found one of them that has ever had the slightest doubt about the continuity of the weekly cycle since long before the Christian era. So the weekly cycle hasn't changed. There's no change in the continuity of the week according to the U.S. Naval Observatory at Washington, D.C. So we have a record of the Sabbath being instituted at creation. Should it ever have been lost, then it was reinstituted when the manna fell. Should it ever have been lost, it was reinstituted then at Sinai, or even before Sinai, they were, in, they were asked to call the, to keep the Sabbath. And then from 46 BC, the Julian calendar comes into effect. And the Julian calendar was in effect at the crucifixion. Well, if the Sabbath had ever been lost, then certainly it was confirmed at the cross because they rested on the Sabbath day, and Jesus kept the Sabbath day, and the Julian calendar remained intact until 1582, when it changed over to the Gregorian calendar, with a change of dates from the 4th to the 15th, but not a change in the cycle of the days. So the Monday was still followed by the Tuesday, by the Wednesday, etc., so nowhere is there any hope of proving that the Sabbath day has changed in any way whatsoever. So the Sabbath is still the Saturday today. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, said Jesus in Matthew 24, 20. So projecting forward to the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, he said, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day, so the Sabbath day would still be in effect even then. What about the text in Colossians 2.16, which is quoted so often as the Sabbath being removed? Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of new moon or of the Sabbath days, plural. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a feast day, or a new moon, or a Sabbath day in the, King, in the ASV. So, here we have Sabbath days rather than the Sabbath day. Please remember that eating and drinking is not part of the moral law, but part of the ceremonial law. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was placed beside the ark, and contained the ceremonial rather than the moral law which was placed inside the ark. 
that was against us. The handwriting of ordinances was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So the ceremonial law fulfilled all the aspects of Christ's ministry, and they were nailed to the cross because they were fulfilled in him, but not the moral law. Let no man therefore judge you, because these were a shadow of things to come, the reality being Christ. So these laws that were nailed to the cross, they pointed forward and they were in the sanctuary service. They were the shadow laws. But the weekly Sabbath was instituted in Eden and points back to creation. So the Sabbath has no injunction to be changed. Did the disciples change the Sabbath? And Paul, as his manner was, went unto them three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, Acts 17, 2. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So they came on the Sabbath day. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So the following Sabbath, they came together again. The disciples kept the Sabbath day. He has the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. These are the identifying features of God's people at the end of time. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. It has to be a heart religion. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Revelation 22, 14. These are powerful injunctions that the law of God is immutable and unchangeable. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. 2 Peter 3, 13. Now what will we be doing in that new heaven and in that new earth? Let's read it. As for the new heavens and the new earth which I make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. So we will keep the Sabbath day even in the new world. Then what is this new moon feast? Isn't that a ceremonial feast? Well, the Bible says that the tree of life bears its fruit once a month. So I assume that we will have a monthly festival in the holy city and a weekly gathering in the holy city. The monthly to partake of the tree of life and the weekly to celebrate the Sabbath with the Lord our God. And the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Psalms 37, 29. What is righteousness? It's doing what is right. And what is right is keeping the commandments of God. If we love Him, we keep His commandments. May the Lord bless us as we contemplate this issue of the Sabbath, which has not changed since its inception and will even be kept in the new world.